So welcome to the Sustainable Lifestyle and Education um, Leader Series. I'm Carolina at Stockholm Environment Institute, and I'll be your host of the session. Today, we have Marcus Terho from Citra with us. I would like to first start with the introduction of Marcus. So Marcus Tejo and his team encourage everyone in Finland to make sustainable choices in their daily life and help companies that have developed sustainable consumer products and services to grow through exper experimentation. Marcus has decades of valuable experience in sustainable development, both in creating strategies and visions and in implementing them in practice. He has also has a master's degree in technology. So thank you, Marcus, um, for coming to speak with the One Planet Network Sustainable Lives and Education Program Contributor Cohort. Um, the first question I we have for you um, is on sustainable lifestyles. Could you, in a couple of sentences, tell us what drew you to sustainable lifestyles? Uh, first, thanks for the invitation to come and have a dialogue today with you. The first idea about this kind of sustainable lifestyles came to me maybe 2005 2007 i used to work for a company called nokia and at this time frame we had our kind of one billion customers globally and i just made a small calculation that if we could could get every one of them to switch off their lights and unplug their charger how much energy would be saved and if it was more than the annual energy consumption of Denmark and the Netherlands put together. And I thought that, hmm, maybe there would, could be something here that by small changes with a large population. And that's where the journey kind of started. That's very, very interesting. Um, then that follows really the second question that we have um, for you is, yeah, about you. How did you channel this personal interest in sustainable lifestyles and sustainable lifestyles into a career? And yeah, like um, we are really keen to learn about how you got from where you started to get to where you are now. How has my journey happened? Uh, very early on, I remember my granddad and my parents kind of taking me and my uncle. He's a biologist and, and this kind of experience of just everyday nature close to where we lived, that kind of experiences. Then during my kind of teenage years, I forgot about all of that. When I got to the university and started, started to do my master's thesis on, on polymer chemistry, at that time, at least in Finland, it was very rare to have any kind of university type of courses. This was early 90s that would have strong kind of environmental theme. There were courses where kind of engineers calculated that how tall the chimney should be in a factory so that if the workers live near the factory so that the air pollution would go far enough so that it wouldn't impact the workers. So that kind of courses were, were there and kind of cleaning of wastewater and, and uh, kind of uh, landfilling of waste, that kind of stuff was, was there. But I started to think when I was doing my master's thesis for, uh, for Nokia, that it, would there be a way to provide a product with smaller environmental impact without compromising any of the kind of things that the customers uh, want? And I stumbled on this kind of life cycle assessment idea, which was introduced by the I, the Association of Chemistry or something like that, CTAC, and lifestyle invent, life cycle inventories of, of certain materials had been made. And then I started to think that maybe this could be something to explore because I've always enjoyed doing something where there's no guidebook. So no, no one has, so kind of Captain Kirk kind of thing, <laughs> go where no one has gone before and see what you can do. So. So then I proposed it to my professor who said that this is a terrible idea. Don't do this. This has nothing to do with chemistry. Absolutely horrible idea. I went back. How we do master's thesis in Finland is that you have a kind of half of the time, half, half a year typically you work on that. Half of the time you do theory 
and then you prove your theory in practice by working with a company or organization or something like that. And I went back to Nokia and said that my professor says that it's a stupid idea. And they said that we actually we like your idea. We should do it. And then two persons from Nokia went to meet the professor. And then the professor came very red faced out of the meeting room and said that you can do this thesis. And that's where it kind of started. I, I did that. It was a life cycle assessment of a fiber optic cable. And once I had that, done that, I found a few other people in Nokia who were working in this kind of future research for the company, which had nothing to do with the current business, but something that would kind of make the company successful going forward beyond 15, 20 years. And I was able to propose to them that maybe we should look at kind of making sure that everything that the company does happens with the smallest possible negative environmental impact. And that's where this kind of started. And we were two people in 1994. And when I left Nokia in 2015, I headed an organization where we had 148 full-time corporate responsibility specialists working on kind of social and environmental responsibility. So it grew from environmental to social responsibility. And when Microsoft bought the handset business of Nokia, I got to meet them when the due diligence of this purchase was made. And then uh, I thought that time to do something else. And then I started to dive into this kind of lifestyle related topic and found the Finnish Innovation Fund. And they were starting a program. And I did a small consultation job for, for this organization to kind of polish out the proposal that they had made. And then they invited me to run the program so that's how i'm here so a little bit of luck and chance and interest in the topic very yeah. lengthy answer sorry about that <laughs> no that that's super interesting to hear and yeah definitely thank you for sharing that that journey um i can we can probably follow the next question um is about your organization so um could you share with us um citra's work in sustainable lifestyles and what is something exciting that you are working on at Citra right now? I believe you have a you have already prepared the, the slides. Yeah, I have a, I have a few slides slides on that. But before I start to show them, I'll just a little bit give a background of what this Finnish Innovation Fund Citra is. Uh, it's a strange organization set up as a birthday present for the Finnish people when Finland was celebrating its 50th anniversary of independence in 1967 with the mission of making the country better in the future for Finnish people and the role of the organization or what it is it has focused on has changed during the years but the mission still stays and the organization reports to the parliament but we've been lucky enough that that the endowment that the government gave us initially in 67 that we ran out of the money in late 80s and then the head of the organization went to the minister of finance to ask that could we get a new endowment from the government and the minister answered that no we will not give you any money but the, the government owns shares in Finnish companies so we will give you some shares of an unknown company called Nokia. And, <laughs> and then in five to six years, those shares were worth more than a billion euros. And now that endowment has been for many years invested into sustainable different types of investment vehicles. And, and we get a dividend out of that and then run all of the program work based on this dividend. So majority of the money that we use is actually used in development programs, uh, new information kind of creation, uh, research type of work. But may, most of the work is kind of practical trials, uh, pilots with cities, municipalities, companies, even private citizens and non-governmental organizations. So we fund those activities, but we are a weird organization that we don't have a kind of grant making process, but we 
based on our strategy, we try to see that what are things that are not happening in, fin in the Finnish society that, that should be started and what are things that are going slower than they would if we would get if we decided to get involved. So we kind of look for those opportunities and then work together with the organizations we fund. So we, we don't give grants and then someone else does the work. That's not how we operate. So very short introduction to the organization. We have three themes that we work on. One is democracy. Second is fair data economy. And third is sustainability solutions. And under these sustainability solutions, there are four projects ongoing. And all of the work is formed into kind of time constraint projects that last from two to three and a half years. And that's the time that we have to initiate something new or speed up something that has already existed in the Finnish society. And the pro project I work for, uh, is called Sustainable Everyday Life. And then we have a sister project who's looking at kind of advancing circular economy in the country. And then another sister project that, that provides for policymakers easy to understand data on climate change and, and biodiversity. And then the fourth team runs our World Circular Economy Forum and other type of international cooperation. So those are the kinds of things that we work on. But if I a little bit explain, and Carolina, let me know when I have five minutes to go, and then, then I can wrap, wrap it up. But a few slides about sustainable everyday, everyday life and how we have appro approached this. Hopefully, you can now see the, see the slides. So the Finnish Innovation Fund for the past five years has been working on ways to interact with citizens with the idea that can everyone find their own way to build good life that is sustainable. And so far, we've defined sustainability in relation to climate change, so that keeping to the 1.5 degree warming target. And this work has been relatively successful here in Finland, so we've been no or the work has been noticed in other countries and by the EU Commission. And we've gotten kind of encouragement that, hey, maybe we could speed up similar work in other countries that could we help and support that kind of stuff. And for that purpose, we've created a kind of peer learning global community around the work that we have initially done in Finland. But, but I think the value of this peer learning community is that Anyone who joins or any organization that joins that are committed to the fact that when they use the originally in Finland made methods, whatever new they develop, they return it back to the community and help other teams that come after them to do the same work with the updated methods. And that community is called Shift 1.5. But the kind of main idea why to work on this area is, is that we believe that activating citizens actually drives and pushes forward what governments, municipalities, cities, companies, non-governmental organizations already do to combat climate change. So we can speed up the work if we get people activated and can show that this grassroots level change is actually happening, but it's not yet noticed. And Many times we end, kind of have these conversations that is this a systemic change or should why are you blaming the individual? We are not blaming the individual. We are trying to give tools and kind of positive suggestions what to do more of, what to change in, in terms of what you eat, how you live, how you move about, what type of products and services you buy. And combined, the systemic change is how energy is produced without carbon emissions, how heating, electricity, cooling, our uh, transportation systems, city structures and planning and all of that happens. So those definitely need to take place, but they can be kind of complemented by everyday choices that, that people make. And they can, they can give a surprisingly large global contribution in terms of driving down carbon emissions. Very shortly, kind of this timeline, what we've done. So we started end of 2016 with this project at, at Citra. And first, we 
interviewed experts and asked them a simple question that, that if you would be king or queen of Finland, we don't have one, but if you would be one and you could order people to change their daily habits or everyday practices, what would, you, what would be your 10 commandments be? And the two first commandments were always the same, but the eight that followed were totally different to each other, depending on the expert. And then some experts couldn't think of even 10 things to command. So we thought that hmm, if the experts cannot kind of, with the drop of a hat, give a list that you should do this, how can kind of a norm, quote unquote, normal person know what changes in their everyday lives create a large, medium or small impact reduction in terms of climate change. And then we just simply looked at as many things as possible to change and how well would we be able to model the climate impact of that particular habit change. And we ended up by purpose kind of to, when we saw that we can do a lot, then okay, let's try and do a hundred so that there's enough that you can build unique, com many, many unique combinations. So everyone can find their own way of building good life that is sustainable. And then we quickly realized that a hundred suggestions is way too much. So no one will go through this kind of every day and find that what would be a suggestion for me. And then we thought that we need some kind of digital tool to kind of pinpoint those suggestions that work for you in your current moment in life. And that's where this idea of a machine came about. And then it evolved into a lifestyle test. And the original brief for the team that was building it was that with five questions so that you could do it while you sit, sit in a bus or a metro or somewhere. You could do it in 30 seconds. So, but we failed and we now, first version had 24 questions. Now we have 27 questions because we had some user input that certain things should be asked. So now we have 27 questions, roughly five minutes you spend on that and you get personalized suggestions what to change and you can build now a plan based on that. So you can think that I'm already doing this. These are things that I could consider to change and then we can see how big the impact is per individual who uses. It. And then the language that we use is based on kind of trying to better understand what are things that actually are behind the decisions that Finns make. And the same model has been used by Vanessa and, and the team in, in Canada, and will, it will be replicated in the UK most likely next and, and possibly Sweden. So how to kind of give people better understanding that what do I get if I change my habits? And that typically is something else than climate or environmental matters. So it can be kind of well-being, better health, saving your time, saving your money, doing something fun with others, being an example, things like that. So using that kind of language, we can talk to a much wider audience than if we would kind of go with the spearhead of climate and environmental matters, then we speak to those who have already kind of made a decision that I want to do something because of climate. But that's unfortunately in Western societies, it's, it varies a little bit, but it's kind of from 25% of the population to maybe 35%. So we are missing out quite many of the population if we just talk about climate. And we thought that good success, success with our digital tool would be that, that if we get 50,000 times someone uses the tool. And that happened very, very fast. And in two years time, we had more than a million times someone had done, done the test. And today we are a little bit over 1.3 million times someone has taken time and looked at how can I change my daily habits and build good life for myself that is sustainable. So we've done more than 50 projects or experiments together with cities, municipalities, ministries, companies, non-governmental organizations, and private individuals in Finland. And out of those 50, we've then kind of distilled now 14 different methods that we think would 
help a change maker team in another country to do the work that we've done for in kind of four years that they could shorten that time frame down to maybe a year and have all that kind of uh, content and guidance available to citizens in in their particular country or region or city and for that reason we've then put all of these 14 ways of working and tools in into kind of descriptions of how they can be used and we call it a method book and each of the teams can pick one two three or even 14 of, of them and use them as they feel kind of that would be suitable in their context but the main idea there is that 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 interface towards the citizens needs to be tailored so that it feels local and culturally relevant so it can't be done centrally from finland or from another country so we have no idea how how this kind of content should be presented to people in turkey or to people in portugal or canada or elsewhere so we need a local team who understands the context and can put it into good use and for that reason we've created this community of change and we've been lucky enough that eu commission has thought that hey this makes sense and the first wave of scaling the impact happens now in seven countries plus finland in an eu project that will last three and a half half years and they'll the commission is investing five million euros into tailoring of this content and then we do an updated version of the digital tool that that the citizens see and use maybe i'll skip this is how our current tool looks like in Finland. So it's very simple web-based thing. Push a button, 20 questions appear, and they are questions that you can answer if you can read. We just had a trainee who's 14 years old, and she could do the test and get her personal suggestions. So any, anyone can, can do it. Then the second version that we've done of the iteration in Finland is, is this kind of good life planning tool that the end result gives you a menu where you can kind of tick it that these are things that I, I would like to change and you can see what, what the climate impact of that is. And the kind of belief here is that good life it actually is sustainable and our national surveys that we've done three times now show that those people that live a sustainable lifestyle they are actually more what's the right english word it's not happier but they are kind of they find their life more meaningful and now there are people who study the fact that is it so that you find your life meaningful and then you start to live in a sustainable manner or do you live first in a sustainable manner and that makes your life more meaningful so that's really kind of interesting that it's not a negative spiral where you give up and reduce and don't do bad things but actually if you live in a sustainable manner you feel better about your life very quickly our kind of philosophy it's on the left hand side here everything that we do towards the citizens is kind of developed and planned in a way that we put a person or an individual in the center. And we try to make positive suggestions of what to do more of. And that's just because of our brain chemistry that how societies evolve and how people evolve is around the fact that we want to do something that develops us, develops us as humans or develops the society. And typically that's something that you kind of want to do more of. So it's hard to get people engaged if you say what not to do. But it's easier if you can put it in a way that hey, these are positive things that you can do more of. Everything you can do like that. So there are a few areas where we have to say that you need to reduce. But we try to do this kind of positive frame. And then where you come across of this content, we try to put it into places where it would come from an organization or a person that you're already familiar with so that We've studied where people spend their digital time and their physical time and try to work with those organizations so that this content would come to from a place that you already trust. And then I talked about this kind of 
motivations to actually change your habits. So it can be something much, something totally different than climate for most people. So how do we use that to our benefit and make the content appealing to the largest possible uh, portion of the population? And then this kind of explorer mindset, it may be kind of weird, what does that mean? But what we're trying to say here is that it's not a one thing that you do, it's not black and white, but this is a journey that you have to kind of be on for, for it's a lifelong journey. So it's not something that do three things differently and then climate change solved, okay, let's do something else. But it, it's something that you, you need to experience and explore. Uh, your whole life's life lifespan. And then the last one is we're trying to put together two pieces of kind of research page based approaches. One is kind of how latest behavior change models say that things should be pushed forward. And then this consumption based carbon footprint that these two come together. And our 40 methods are under these four headings that you can see in this, what we call a key for change, which is in the middle. And we have methods that help change maker teams to understand what does this 1.5 degree lifestyle look like. And those we've developed together with IGES and ALPA and others. So this is not work that Citra does alone, but we've been lucky enough to find great partners like One Earth and IGES and others that, that have been contributing uh, quite significantly to, to all of this content. Then the second area is that how to understand human behavior better. So there are methods for, for that. And once you know the context, understand how to change people's behavior and what makes them tick, then you can run these kind of actions to catalyze change. And there are pro kind of models how to engage with the business community, with non-governmental organizations, private citizens directly. And then last but not least this kind of storytelling, which mostly is kind of how, how do you uh, provide digital content on social media to remind people of, of the fact that they can do things differently. And it's tied to things that kind of hashtags that people already use. It's not kind of sustainability driven uh, tweets or whatever, but when people share things about Christmas, Easter, I don't know, birth of a baby, Whatever is a kind of well-known and widely used hashtag, we piggyback on that because from the hundred suggestions, we have something that always fits on a popular occasion in the world. So it's easy to direct then people with that one suggestion to 99 other things. I talked about the med kind of the, the motivations. I would have liked to show, shown also the Canadian version, but I couldn't fi find it. So sorry about that one. But when people typically think that, and businesses particularly, that you can only engage with sustainability in terms of a product or service if it's low price, and then it can be also sustainable. And then people will buy it. But when we look at what's behind the decisions that Finns make, and these were seem surprisingly similar in Canada, that it's actually not price, but it's something that is related to people you love. So creating joy to yourself, to your loved ones, living an independent life, you feel that you're in control, you're making decisions. Many Finns are surprisingly eager to do some small actions for the environment, meaning that they can pick up litter or they, they'll recycle. They consider that to be small. But understanding these things, you can then kind of write the suggestions for people in a way that it speaks to the widest possible audience. I'll maybe skip some of these. I promise to do, provide something new that we are doing. When we are looking at which countries are kind of the highest on the list of where we would like to expand the shift 1.5 community next. We have so far looked at the consumption-based carbon footprint of an individual, and then an OECD index on how mature the country is. But we also wanted to gauge that how ready are people to change their behavior. And we've now experimented with, with, the, with a way that asking 
I think it's now eight questions in a national survey. We can predict the readiness to change of, an, of the population. And we've done this now in three countries, Germany, Portugal, and Finland. And we can, with this tool, we can easily see that would it be kind of a good thing to focus your activity on some smaller group in the population. I apologize for this. Sari's daughter, Sari is our expert on, on behavior change. And Sari's daughter said that, mom, your graph look absolutely horrific. They are terrible. So this is our draft version of the, of, the, of the tool. But the idea is that it will be open source, given to anyone who wants, wants to use it, and particularly people who do these kind of national surveys by adding eight questions, you can gauge the readiness to change towards sustainable lifestyles very quickly. And then profile that is it a male, female, age, uh, kind of city, rural area thing or what what is it so so that's something that we'll 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 develop and in a month's time it should be part of our change maker kit the method i'll end with maybe that or maybe last word that i've now talked about this kind of individual and the carbon footprint each of us has if you work just on your own carbon footprint you can only kind of maximum contribution you can do is around 8,000 kilograms of carbon. But if you are able to impact the choices of your friends, your family, people you go to hobbies with, communities you belong to, or maybe you have a million people following you on Twitter or something, or you work in a large organization, talking about these kind of practical choices you've done differently, not trying to say that become a climate hero but talk about the fact that hey i've tried this vegetarian recipe i've used a city bike i biodiesel works nicely in my car so these kind of practical experiences that when we talk about them with our friends and family and people we know we can actually make much much larger impact thousand times ten thousand times bigger than just looking at our own choice So last slide, no single bullet here. So there's no one way to live a good life that is sustainable, but every one of us can find our unique combination of changes to our everyday practices and find that we can have a good life and it is sustainable. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much for sharing those wonderful and inspiring projects, and insightful strategies behind them. And, um, and also it's really interesting to see like the difference in gender for especially the readiness index. And also, yeah, thank you for reminding us that the actions from each individual um, really matters. Our last question for you would be, um, um, what would be the one piece of, of advice from you um, for people who are just starting their career um, in the field of sustainable lifestyles. Whatever you find of interest in terms of kind of your professional life, maybe you are really interested in numbers or economics or I don't know, engineering, what, whatever it is. Think about it from the point of view that in that particular profession, how could you use your kind of professional power to advance the move towards a sustainable society. So don't think about only your individual choices, but your kind of work role. How could you do something that in that particular role? So I think that everyone from a person who's providing cleaning services to the CEO of a multinational company, everyone can have in their job, you can take a view or kind of advanced sustainability from that perspective so i think that would be something that don't think that you have to be in a or only being in a sustainability driven job you can make a contribution i think everyone can and we we see kind of good signs already so the financial communities developing all kinds of green bonds to, to companies 
people who work with um, product development, they're developing all kinds of tools, how to assess the environmental impact of different design choices and, and so forth. So there, there's plenty of things that can be done and, and uh, plenty of blue ocean to be discovered in different types of job roles. Thank you so much for the, yeah, the advice. So this is Marcus Tejo from Citra. Thank you for joining us, Marcus. It's been a real pleasure having you with us today. Thanks.